In 1953, a 25-year-old director named Phil Tucker had $16,000 in just four days to make his first sci-fi film. The plot? A creature comes to Earth with a death ray and wipes out all of humanity, except for eight people who are immune to the creature's weapons. He called the film Robot Monster. With the swiftness of a deadly cosmic ray, the Earth is invaded by indestructible moon monsters. Their ghastly mission, death for all humans. The film was so low budget, Tucker couldn't even afford a good alien costume. So he had the monster in a gorilla suit with a TV for a head. What astounding technical developments are being made to protect mankind. The release was a disaster. It was widely panned. Its lasting legacy would have been that it was one of the worst movies of all time. But in the early 2000s, a kid from New Jersey with a knack for drawing comics saw a picture of the robot monster and it stuck with him. I've never even actually seen the film, but I saw pictures of this creature over the years. And they've got like a TV set, kind of circular space looking head, and they have like a gorilla body. And I was like, I want a superhero that's kind of inspired by this. The kid's name was Gerard. He'd been writing comics since he was 15 and was on his way to making it as a professional comic book artist. I went to art school and I was an illustration cartooning major. So comics were kind of like my major. And I was like this perpetual intern. Like I interned at DC, I pitched a cartoon to Cartoon Network, and then I landed a job as a toy designer at this place called Funhouse in Hoboken. But that's like right when the band took off. That band? Gerard's side hustle would become massive alt-punk sensation, My Chemical Romance. Seemingly overnight, My Chemical Romance and Gerard were making some of the most popular music in the world, getting spins on terrestrial radio, dominating music video countdowns. They were even nominated for a Grammy. But while he traveled across the globe leading a rock star life, Gerard kept up with his first love, drawing. So I really missed comics. And we were in Japan... And we did a signing at a shop and one of the fans gave me a little marker set and it was Copic markers. They were like the greatest markers that I had ever used before. And so I started to create Luther. Luther, a superhero with a gorilla body and space helmet who lives on the moon, was the very first character Gerard drew in what would become his hit comic book, The Umbrella Academy. I'm Brandon Jenkins, and this is Behind the Scenes, The Umbrella Academy. This season, we're going backstage and inside the making of season two. The first season of the show, based on Gerard's comic of the same name, launched in February of last year and quickly became one of the most beloved series on Netflix. Now it's back for its second season with bigger effects, bigger characters, and bigger drama. We're going to catch you up on everything that's gone down in the Umbrella Academy universe so far. And we'll spend the next five episodes breaking down how the team shot the multi-million dollar superhero production across two countries and how in the midst of a global pandemic, they managed to finish it from inside their own homes. But first, we wanted to take a look back and dig into the roots of the Umbrella Academy. So today, I'm catching up with the creators of the comic and the guy tasked with making the TV series. We talk about how the graphic novel was adapted for your screens. All right, so if you haven't watched season one, go back and watch season one on Netflix. For those of you who just need a quick recap, at 12 p.m. on October 1st, 1989, a supernatural event occurred. 43 babies across the planet were born to mothers who were not pregnant just seconds before. The world was confused, intrigued, and one eccentric billionaire wanted to find the babies and adopt them. He ended up with seven. Each baby had a superpower. And what do you do when you're a billionaire with a group of kids with superpowers? You train them to become a crime-fighting family. I give you the inaugural class of the Umbrella Academy. When Gerard Way started creating the members of the Academy, he started with the most fundamental material. I created a list of all the things that interested me. Hmm. It could be anything from Ouija board, fortune teller, spaceman, gorilla body, just a list of stuff. Then he drew from that list and started creating these characters. All in all, he would draw seven. The first, Luther, the half-man, half-gorilla, was the team's de facto leader. He was also the child closest with their father. 
Just at Dad's favorite spot. Dad had a favorite spot? Yeah, you know, under the oak tree. We used to sit out there all the time. None of you ever do that? Next, he created Klaus and Allison, the boy who talks to the dead, and the girl who can make people bend to her will with just a few words. Klaus. He has some pretty serious addiction issues, and addiction is something that I dealt with in my life. He's also a little bit spooky and supernatural, and my persona and my chemical romance is very similar to that. I can't just call Dad in the afterlife and be like, Dad, could you stop playing tennis with Hitler for a moment and take a quick call? Since when? That's your thing. I'm not in the right frame of mind. You're high? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, how are you not listening to this nonsense? He was like kind of my version of like Doctor Strange. I find Allison to be the one that is easiest to write, and I put the most of myself into Allison. Her superpower is that she can make you do pretty much anything she tells you with a few magic words. I heard a rumor you want to be my friend. I heard a rumor that you like I heard a rumor you left me I heard a rumor that you stop crying. There's a bit of like a tragic nature that comes with her power. Allison, out of all of her superpowered siblings, is the only one grasping for a normal life. Career, husband, children. In a way, she's the most human. The fourth character Gerard created is Diego, a guy with an uncanny ability to throw knives. He's also stubborn as hell. I knew early on he was going to be the one that was going to be really difficult with the leader. I, I figured that. You know, you of all people should be on my side of here, number one. I am warning you. After everything he did to you, he had to ship you a million miles away. Diego, stop talking. That's how much he couldn't stand the sight of you. <gasps> the fifth character, a kid who can travel through time and space, who simply goes by five. Despite the other characters growing up into adults, he has remained a teenager, sort of. He was a time traveler who then got stuck in his young body when he traveled back in time because time travel is complicated. Where are you going? To get a decent cup of coffee. Do you even know how to drive? I know how to do everything. <laughs> so then came the horror. The horror, AKA Ben, AKA the dead sibling who only Klaus can see. I imagine this character that had all these monsters living under his skin that came from another dimension. And he was very tortured to me. It actually yeah, like, kind of yeah. hurts him, and it's scary to him. Do I really have to do this? Come on, Ben. There's more guys in the vault. <sighs> I didn't sign up for this. And then finally, number seven, Fanya, who seemingly has no powers besides playing the violin. I was at um, this cafe in Manhattan when I was living in Brooklyn, and it was called the Sidewalk Cafe, I believe. And on the wall, they had a white violin, just as decoration. And I remember looking at that and thinking to myself, that would be a cool superhero. And Vanya was always kind of designed to be a character who wasn't special that was going to transform into that. Look, if I was special, I would have been in the Umbrella Academy. I'm so sorry you got stuck with the ordinary one. These seven adopted siblings, forced together by supernatural events, formed the Umbrella Academy. Both the original comic and season one of the show start at the funeral for the Academy's patriarch, the eccentric Sir Reginald Hargreaves. We learn that while the siblings ventured away from home as teenagers, after years of fighting and a toxic upbringing, they returned home, back together for the first time in years. And all of their dysfunctions and old conflicts come bubbling to the surface. He was a bad person and a worse father. The world's better off without him. Diego. My name is number two. When he started writing the comic, Gerard was focused on his own strained relationships. He saw his band as his own dysfunctional family at the time. When you're a baby band, you know, you're in this van and it's like a submarine, but it's smaller. It's like a closet that you're all living in. And sometimes you're going on like 17 hour drives and you have very strong personalities. This dynamic starts to develop between all the members and you really do kind of become a dysfunctional family. Like there's, there's times where I felt like I was the mom 